Okay, okay. I am so glad that we live out what Jesus preached. In the book of John, chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. If I let you all go, you probably go for like an hour loving on each other. But you know, there's a, there's a hymn that was written in the 60s based on that verse. And for the comfort of the saints, I'm not going to sing it. But I can read it. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. If there's two distinctive things I've found in this community of faith we call Communion House, it is unity of the Spirit. And it is love. Genuinely, we love one another as brother and sister. I mean, it's real. I remember uh, not too long ago, I was in a little bit of a financial strain, and I mentioned it to a brother here in this place, and they said, well, what do you need? And I said, and they provided it. Just in a moment. And that's not happened only once. You know, it's easy to give somebody a hug. It's tougher to reach in your pocket, pull out your wallet, and, you know, give that precious earned money, that money maybe you plan for something else other than helping your brother. So I praise God for this community of faith. I praise God for our head pastor who demonstrates that kind of love and who draws from the community that kind of unity. And it's at this time that we enjoy the fine teaching, the practical teaching. And you know, there's one thing I think the world needs a whole lot more, especially if you look at the political arena. We need a whole lot more humor. And I love the way Pastor Moses so often, while he takes God and scripture seriously, he's able to bring humor at the throne of grace. Pastor Moses. No pressure, Brother Lawrence. Um, so, it makes me feel like I have to be funny tonight. But I'm just going to be me. I think that would do. <laughs> Brother Lawrence, I appreciate you greatly, and thank you for sharing um, about the generosity that is here at Communion House. I am one of those people, I strongly believe that one of the ways by which you can tell that the presence of God is in a place is through the generosity of the people. You see, because the thing is, the Bible says that the presence of God is light. And when light shines, and you are in the presence of light, you will be seen because the light will reflect on you. I mean, just look at me, standing right here under this light, it illuminates, it brings to light. And so if the presence of God is in a place, every object, everything that is within the perimeter of that light within the sphere of influence of that light needs to have a reflection of the light if someone tells you that there is light in a place and you stand in the presence of that light and there is no reflection of that light on you open your eyes it is not light it might be some kind of coloration, but it is not light because if it is light, it must reflect. And so, when we are in a place like this and we say that we have the presence of God, how does that reflect on us? It reflects in the form of generosity 
It reflects in the form of the willingness to forgive one another. It reflects in the form of being able to adopt one another as brothers and sisters. Why? Because that is exactly what happens in the presence of God. You see, because the Bible says that the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is liberty. In the presence of God, there is what? There is liberty. So you can see the Bible breaks it down to us that there is no presence of God without the spirit of God. And when the spirit of the Lord is present, you should expect to see a manifestation of the attributes of the spirit of God in the people in that presence. And how does the Bible describe the spirit of God? The Bible says that the spirit of God is a generous spirit that the Lord gives his spirit without measure. And so if a people claim to be named by the name of God, if they call themselves believers, remember, or be mindful, I didn't say Christian because the word Christian has been so bastardized. The word Christian has come to mean not more in most cases than just a religion or a segment of the society. And that is why I am always careful to use the word believer because the one who believes are the ones who bear fruits. The ones who believe are the ones who do the things that he said, not just who, the ones who carry the name of Christ. And so when you have a gathering of believers, one of the things that you need to see is generosity. We need to be generous with our resources. We need to be generous with our time. We need to have the willingness to make the sacrifice. And one of the other things that are very, and one of the things to look out for when you come to a gathering of believers is the willingness, like I said, to adopt one another. The Bible lets us know in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 15 that we have not received the spirit of limitation or the spirit of bondage again to fear but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry Abba Father. So basically it is by the Holy Spirit that you and I became the children of God because he came and he adopted us. And so if I truly am a believer and I claim to be part of a ministry that is called to answer the need of the world under the instruction of the Holy Spirit, then the people in there need to show and demonstrate that willingness to take one another in to adopt each other as brothers and sisters. People have accused me of being old-fashioned because I call people brother and sister. My, my brother Brian, my brother Mickey, my sister Tonya. I call people brothers and sisters because I never want to forget that that is who you are to me. Because the more I operate with that mentality, now I'm not saying you should go around calling people brother and sister. You can find your own way of keeping yourself in remembrance. Personally, it just helps me. So you don't have to be old school like I am old school. But one thing that I want you to be as I am is an example of a believer, not just in word, but also in conduct. And so when we come together like this and we say we are people of God, named by his name, those are the things that need to become apparent amongst us. Am I willing to take you on as my brother? And what does it mean to take you on as my brother? What it means to take anyone on as a brother or a sister, to adopt them into your family, is to recognize that whatever prosperity comes to them comes to you. One of the most repeated descriptions of the family of God is the shared inheritance. The Bible says that we are joint heirs together with what? With whom? With Christ Jesus. When God was talking about the way that he wants to bless you, he says, I will bless you according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus, by your brother who came ahead of you and created a way for the Holy Spirit to come to then bring you in and delete the name that you've always carried because until Jesus came, every one of us, our last name was sinner. So no matter what your first name was, your last name was sinner. Simply because you were born into a world where humanity had taken on an identity that was alien to its original intention. 
or to God's original intention. When we were made, originally we were made to be ambassadors of heaven, to be carriers of the glory of God. And Romans 3.23 lets us know what exactly happened. The Bible says, in there, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We sinned, we stopped having the last name of glory, the last name of God, we started to answer the last name of sin. But thank God because the Holy Spirit came and deleted, deleted the sin and once again gave us the name of the Father. And that is why the Bible says that having been adopted, we can now say Abba, Father. The word Abba there is not just Daddy, it's not just Father, but it is a personalization of that posterity and that lineage and that inheritance that you now belong to. It is a way of saying my own Daddy. And that is what we have because we believe. So today, I would share with us on the subject of his name. When I asked the Father today, I asked the Holy Spirit, as I was waiting on him for this meeting, what I should speak about. He turned the question around to me and he said to me, what do you see as a need? And for those people who are familiar with me, I understand that my existence on earth is to be in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Because there is none of the assignments that God has committed into my hands that I can do successfully without the Holy Spirit. I say that not to repeat myself for those who have heard me say that before, but I say that to challenge you and to encourage you. If you haven't paid attention to your relationship with the Holy Spirit, if you haven't come to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is the time to ask and say, you know what? I need that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had 12 gentlemen who walked with him from the beginning of his earthly ministry till the very end of that ministry for three and a half years. Three and a half years of apprenticeship directly with the Lord Jesus should qualify anybody for any assignment. Just imagine, Matt, if you had an opportunity to have walked with Jesus, to have stayed in the same hotel as him, to have attended the same conferences, to have eaten together, to have gone bowling together, you witnessed the raising of the dead. You witnessed him being rejected by people. You witnessed him being celebrated by people. You went through all of that. You saw the way that he healed a man by spitting into the ground and forming new eyeballs right there in your face. What better training can anybody get than to have had such a hands-on training being in the discipleship of the one that is called the fullness of the Godhead. And still, after the three and a half years or three and a third years of earthly ministry and shadowing Jesus, Jesus told his disciples that they still could not fulfill the assignment that he has for them. I don't know about you, but I am confident that if the disciples needed the Holy Spirit to fulfill their assignment, there's no reason why I should be feeling special like I don't need the Holy Spirit. Now you may say about the, whole, the apostles, when they were still disciples, they did not have iPhones. You may be saying, oh, they didn't have the kind of technology that I have. And by the way, Peter did not even go to the kind of university that I went to. Oh, May I remind you that Peter did not even have a car like the fancy one that you have. And so if you think that for some reason, because of technological advancements or because of the fact that you are born to a society wherein you can pretty much do whatever you want, you have all of what you need and you don't need the Holy Spirit, I submit to you that is a deception from the pit of hell and you need to abandon such mentality, drop it like it's hot. Simply because there is no fulfilling of your destiny. There is no answering of the call of God upon your life without the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, he said, of yourselves, you can do nothing. He said, wait until you have received power from on high. 
And so if you have been a Christian since your mother got married to your father even before they conceived you, you have been a Christian. I mean, there are some of us in reality. Think about it, Sister Tanya. Before I was born, my parents were already called Christians. On their birth certificates, in the place where they work, they were called Christians. Even though there weren't many things Christian about them when they had me, because they didn't go to church, Sunday morning was a time to recover from the hangover from all that drinking on Saturday. They spent all their money just on themselves and all the fancy things that they wanted. They didn't really pray for anybody else because they didn't even pray for themselves to start with. They didn't do the things that Jesus said to do. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But then they had the emblem, Christian. So by default, even before I was born, I was already set up to be a Christian. I was born into that home. I got given a Christian, a very fancy Christian name for that matter. How many Moses do you know? I'm trying to keep it humble here, but really. I got given all of that privilege even before I was born. But I tell you what, whether you have been a Christian before you were born or you were born a Christian or you changed your mind along the way and stopped being a Buddhist and you decided, well, me being, being a Buddhist is not very popular in America, so now that I'm here, I choose to be a Christian so nobody bothers me. If you have done every one of those rituals or observed every one of those traditions, it is still not a qualifier for fulfilling the call of God on your life. Nothing is substitute. Nothing can substitute, I should say, the power of the Holy Spirit. And why am I dwelling on that today? I'm dwelling on that today because I want to speak to us about the name of God. And one of the things that I have come to realize is there is a need in the world today and there is a need in the body of Christ for people to remember the name of God. When they asked Jesus of the things that will happen in the end, the disciples asked him, they said, look, we know because even before you came, it, already, it had already been prophesied that there will be an end. Do you know that in the Old Testament it was prophesied that there will be an end? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, surely there is an end and the expectation of the righteous will not be disappointed. So they knew there was an end. And so they asked him, if truly you are the Messiah, then the end is even nearer now than when we first believed. So tell us what things to look out for. And he told them how there will be the denying of the name of God. He told them how people will be drunk with all manners of deception. Jesus literally told them that men will become as zombies following everything that shines without necessarily seeing the light. He said there will be wars and there will be rumors of war. He said even the earth is going to be in turmoil as a woman in birth pains. There will be earthquakes, the weather will change, the heart of men will fail for fear. And after he said all of those things, of course you can imagine that by that time the disciples were just like, what have we done? What kind of question have we asked? We should have just kept to ourselves. Because when you ask God a question like that, that is definitely not the kind of response you want to hear. But he gave it to them and he said to them, in that day, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the lead apostle, Peter, he made that his gospel, the name of the Lord. When Paul came along the line, he made it his gospel. Peter said in Acts chapter 2 verse 21 that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 verse 10, I believe that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I look around me today and every single sector and segment of our lives and endeavors need a saving. Our political system needs a saving, don't you agree? The reputation that we have as a nation needs a saving, don't you agree? You listen to news from other countries, from other places, and they label this God's country, God's own country, a country of elect and select people, is not being labeled with all kinds of labels. Our reputation as a country needs a saving. Because I don't believe for a second that the United States of America came together by accident. I believe that this was that country, that nation that was spoken about in the prophets, that it is as a ring on the finger of God, a precious pearl that the Almighty admires. I believe it is this country because this country has borne such fruits. But now we need a saving. And I don't know about you, even though the economy has been growing and things have been quite steady. 
our finances individually still need a saving in most cases. So you look around you, marriages need a saving. We have never experienced such a high rate of divorce in our lives as we see today. <laughs> Since the millennium time bomb of 2000, marriages have been exploding. Marriages need a saving. Can we talk about children and this new generation, the millennials and the ones even younger than them, do they not need a saving? They need a saving because they have been more attacked than any generation before, bombarded with all kinds of lies and deception, bombarded with all kinds of governmental policies that don't help people to grow and be established. They are bombarded by all kinds of confusion, even technology that they themselves created without even understanding. They need a saving. Because now we've seen addiction in the world today to drugs and all kinds of ex excesses more than we have seen in all of our lives up until now. Folks, without being sentimental or without deceiving ourselves in reality, we need a saving. And because of the fact that there is such a need for a saving, is it not time that we began to remind one another of the only way by which we can be saved? The Bible says there is no other name by which man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Today I want to read to us a verse of scripture that I believe is instrumental to waking every one of us up to the responsibility that we have been given to call on the name of the Lord. And by the time we're done reading the scripture from the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, I believe you would agree with me that it is important for us to not just know to call on the name of God, but to also know to involve the Holy Spirit of God. Can you turn your Bibles with me, please, if you can, to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. So for those people who haven't read their Bible since the time of Ronald Reagan, Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. And we're going to be reading from the very last chapter of Matthew and verse 19. In fact, I want to say this. Let's read from verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This was after Jesus had been raised from the dead. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I command you and lo I am with you always even to the end of age amen three things that I want to point out in that verse of scripture that we just read in that passage but I'm going to begin from the end do you know this was Jesus speaking but his words were not just encouraging words they were a prayer and that was why at the end of it, he said, amen. Folks, if there is anything the believer wants more than anything else, is for every one of our prayers to be answered. We always want our prayers to be answered. We always want to hear that endorsement at the end of our prayer to give us the confidence that we have been heard and there will be a genuine answer to the prayers. And Jesus said a prayer and wrapped it up with a man. So what do I, what do I learn from this verse of scripture? From this passage, the order of the things that I have read is this. Before you can receive that affirmation to the promises that God has made, before your finances can begin to reflect the kind of abundance that God promised, before your heart can begin to enjoy the peace and the joy that the word of God promised, before your words to other people can receive the honor and the respect that is due, particularly parents speaking to children, you know how important that is. Before all of these things can happen, the Bible says, before you can have your amen, certain things have to have happened. And one of those things is that he needs to be with you. 
Folks, you need to have the presence of God. Jesus says, I will be with you till the very end. And if Jesus is with you, then you can expect that the promises of God will be yes and amen in your life. The promises of God that say that you are above always and not beneath. The promises of God that says that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. You know we confirm and we affirm those prayers. But we are often are waiting for the authority of heaven to endorse the things that we declare. So that those things can truly be the realities of our existence. I want to ask you a question before I go on. Is there anybody in here today? Who can say that all of the promises in God's word and the prayers that you have said have already been answered and you are enjoying everything that you've asked for? Everything that you have asked for has already been answered. Mostly. That is a good answer. But there is always usually one or two things that is still pending. We always have things if I, when we think about it thoroughly, there are things that we have actually given up on simply because we said those prayers, but there was no amen. There was no fulfillment. And because of the fact that we are not supposed to be in need, for we have such a good shepherd. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We aren't supposed to be in want or in lack of anything. So when we know that every one of us need to have amen from heaven, to the prayers that we say, if every one of us know and accept that we need the saving, both personally in our families and relationships, as well as in our countries and societies, then why shouldn't we pay attention to the things that are there, line by line, to result in an amen? Jesus pointed out three things in here. He says, I will be with you. The Lord has to be with you. So the question is, how does God be with me? When Jesus came, we know that the Father was still in heaven. Because the people around said to Jesus, well, we have seen you and you claim to have come in the name of the Father, but where is the Father? And Jesus said to them, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So at that point in time, Jesus represented the totality of the Godhead as the Bible says that he in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily but when he was leaving he said to them I am going up that you may do greater works however I am sending you another comforter one that is of the same kind and he is the Holy Spirit and so when Jesus left the one that was prophesied would be called Emmanuel God with us when he left what does that mean then they didn't have the presence of God with them as it was promised because Jesus left. But shortly after he left, the Holy Spirit came. Acts chapter 2 began with an announcement that the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were together in one accord and in one place and there descended from heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And guess who was in the sound? The Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell upon every one of them and there appeared upon their heads cloven tongues or divided tongues as a fire. There was a clear indication that the Holy Spirit had come upon them. The presence of God came and it imbued in them confidence. And after that, men who had been hiding even from little children were not able to boldly stand to proclaim the name of God. Folks who have had need for help who have had need to take cover now became those who performed miracles on the high street simply because God was with them. Everything Jesus promised them, the miracle signs and wonders that he said they will do, received an amen when the Holy Spirit came. You and I need the presence of God because it is by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that God gets to be with us. I want to tell you something folks, God the Father is not coming down from heaven to make his abode on the earth. The Bible already says that heaven is his throne. David says he lives in a place that is beautiful for situation and is called the Mount Zion of the north. Not the Mount Zion that is right past Tel Aviv. We're talking about the Mount Zion that is up there, the city of the great king. That is where God is. And where is Jesus at the moment? 
The Bible lets us know that Jesus is standing, is sitting at the right hand of the Father, far above principalities and powers in the heavens of the heavens. So what are we left with? You and me. We have one option for the presence of God, and that is the Holy Spirit. And to have the presence of the Holy Spirit does not require you paying money. To have the presence of the Holy Spirit does not require you going to a special school. Having the presence of the Holy Spirit does not even require you fasting and praying until you get admitted into the hospital. Having the presence of the Holy Spirit comes in one way. Jesus told his disciples. He said, ask the Father and he will send the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so what are we doing without God's presence we just need to simply ask and say father I want to experience more of the presence of your Holy Spirit and the moment you ask he will begin to guide your step he will begin to orchestrate the things around you he will begin to be loving one another and being in accord because when there is discord there is not room for the Holy Spirit to come but it begins by you asking and how do you ask Jesus showed his disciples I told you there are three things here that I want to bring out first is that he has to be with you and how does he come to be with you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit now the next thing that I want us to look at is this Jesus said to his disciples he said I want you to baptize men in the name of the Father in the name of what does it mean to do things in the name of God you see, the word baptized means to immerse people into an experience or into a thing. When you immerse a person in baptism into a thing, they are expected to rise not as they went, but anew. The Bible says that when we got baptized, as Jesus was buried in death, the penalties of our sins were paid. The transgression that hung around our necks was left behind. And when it was raised up in glory, we became justified. And so when we get baptized into a thing, it's supposed to take away the deadness, the weight, and bring us up anew in liberation. That is what baptism does. So what does it then mean to baptize people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit? Your responsibility and mine is to ensure that we renew our thinking by subjecting all of our experiences to the name of God. We need to make subject all of our expectation to the name of God. I'll give you an example. You've been going through a dry spell. You may have been going through a dry spell in your marriage. Wherein you're finding it difficult to express the love that you have for your spouse. Or you may even be finding it difficult to convince yourself that you still love that spouse. And you're trying to make it work. You've gone on Amazon and you have downloaded books. You've called your friend whose marriage seems to be working. And when you called him and you said to him, dude, I think you can help me out. And he says to you, look, we are only putting up a front. This marriage isn't working. I'm only doing this for tax purposes. Do you know there are times when you have called people whose life you think is better? You call somebody and say, hey, dude, your marriage seems to be working. And he says, I am only putting up a front because my grandmother does not believe in divorce. And she's 87 years old. And I don't want to be in her bad books because I know that her days are numbered. So I'm going to keep this marriage looking good so that when she dies, I can inherit the house. I mean, these are true stories. These are things that I have heard. When you're a consultant and you're a pastor, you hear things. So you have called your friend who seems to be doing better and he admits to you that he's only putting up a front. And here you are, you don't know who else to turn to because your marriage needs a saving. Folks, quit calling on people when you haven't called on God. Let's stop calling on people when we haven't called 
on God because there are certain people out of the goodness of their hearts, they will do their best possible to take the place of God in your life. And they mean well, they want to help. But let me tell you something, the, the capacity, or let me put it this way, the, the space or the vacancy that God inseminated into the hearts of each and every one of us by design can never be filled by a man or a woman or a system or a tool or some kind of technological masterpiece. Only God can fill the space in your heart that he created. So now, Brother Moses, you still haven't told me how to baptize that marriage in the name of God. Whenever you're going through a spell like that, I gave that one in marriage as an example. What you and I need to do is not to find out the best-selling book about marriage, but to find out what the name of God is when it comes to marriage. And then you immerse yourself in what the name of God is when it comes to marriage. Now, what is the name of God when it comes to marriage? I can give you seven names of God when it comes to marriage. But because of time today, I'm going to give you three. One of them, God, is the creator of marriage. Marriage was not your idea. Marriage is not my idea. My initial idea about marriage was an inconvenience. Until the Lord baptized me in his name and I started to see that indeed it is not good for a man to be alone. I started to see that two genuinely is better than one simply because the one who created it is the one who knows how it works best. And so if your marriage isn't working, baptize it in the name of the father of creation who created it because whatever is missing in it, he can add it to it. Another name of God when it comes to marriage is this. <laughs> The Bible says that God is the lover of my soul. I need to take that entire marriage and baptize it in the name of God and bury my insecurities in the name of God, bury my suspicions in the name of God, bury my lack of trust in the name of God and say, God, if you, the creator of marriage, is also the lover of my soul, then you who made me in your image and in your likeness would allow for me to be the lover of this woman's soul and teach me how to do it successfully. Let me go back to the first example. When you know that the name of God is the creator of marriage, one of the things that you will find when you bury your failing marriage in his name is that you will begin to receive insight into exactly how compatible you and your wife are by the hand of God. Because when God made man the creator, he didn't take the woman from another place and bring him and bring her to the man he took so that that compatibility is at the DNA level. And someone is saying, but Brother Moses, you don't understand. I met my wife in a club. Neither of us was saved. So how could God have been involved in that kind of arrangement? You may be saying, I didn't really intend to marry my wife. But you see, Brother Moses, I was on the brink of being deported and she was a citizen. So I decided that I was just going to marry her for a few short years until I got my green card. But here we are, three children later, it's too late. I'm stuck. So this compatibility nonsense that you're talking about, I'm sorry, but I cannot accept it. <laughs> I want to put this to you folks. That which you think was an accident or a coincidence when you recognize that God is the lover of your soul and you love him, he makes everything work together for good to those who love him, even the called according to his purpose. Your accidental get married or met in a club marriage can work by the divine counsel of God. Your excuse of a marriage for immigration can work because he can make all things work together for your good. In the dictionary of heaven, there is no coincidence because God is the beginning and the end of all things. The Bible says that a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. If then the Lord is the one that orders the steps of a man, how can a man understand or take credit for his own ways? That's what the Bible says. 
And so if I cannot take credit for the right that I do, why should I then be saddled with the burden of the wrong that I have done when the writer of every wrong is still on the throne and he can right your wrong? The reason why some people don't even try is because they feel that the foundation of their marriage is already faulty because it's based on principles of men as opposed to the principles of the word of God. I tell you something, folks, if it is your business that we're talking about, if it is your marriage that we're talking about, or your parenting that we're talking about, whatever it is that may have had, had a faulty foundation in your life can be fixed by the wisdom of God. I tell you that so that you can have hope. I tell you that so that you do not let the enemy continue to rob you of remedy that is available in the name of God. Because the devil tells us that we are hopeless because we started wrong. Folks, I may not have started right, but there's every guarantee in the word of God that I can finish right. My marriage may have hit the rocks, but it doesn't have to stay in the wilderness because there is a promised land. My parenting may have been a foul from the beginning because I tried to raise my children at the extreme opposite of the way my parents raised me. And now I have found that there is no balance because I went from one extreme to the other. And the Lord is saying, it is okay. I am the one who makes the crooked path straight. Baptize your marriage, your business your entire life in the name of the creator because for him to have started it means he has finished it because the bible says he is the one who completes a thing even before he begins do you see how knowing the name of god that is appropriate for your situation begins to transform your expectation and the bible says that god's name is beautiful for every situation so i've given you two names of God for that example of marriage is the creator and he knows how to make it work. He is the lover of your soul and you are made in his image and in his likeness. You can submit your insecurities and the dodginess of your frame to his name and he will transform you. The third name of God that I want to give you for marriage is this. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, I believe it's actually 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 8 that love never fails. And God is love. So when you know that the name of God is love, then you will not fail. If you have failed, then it's because you have not submitted yourself into his name. So now say to yourself, now that I know that the name of God is the creator, who is a lover, who in fact his name is love, why then should I fail at loving as I am loved? All I need to do is call on his name and say, God, you are love. And I submit all of my mentalities to you. Because you know what? Quite often, what needs to change is not your hair color for you to be lovable. What needs to change is not the color of your nails for you to be loved by your husband. What needs to change for you as a man, for your wife to love you, is not even necessarily the size of your bank account. What needs to change is your mentality. Because the Bible says that you can only prosper to the tune of the prosperity of your mind. 3 John 2 says, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And submitting and allowing your minds to be washed in the water of his name is all we need to be saved. And in closing, in closing I'm going to say this. The book of Matthew that we have just read. Those three things that I want to bring out, one of them is that God has to be with you. You need to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in your home. It's not rocket science. Ask for it. If you're not feeling the tangibility of it, find somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Ask them to lay hands on you because the Bible lets us know that through the laying on of hands, men were filled with the Holy Ghost. So you can have the presence of God. Secondly, you can be baptized in his name. You can baptize your situation in his name. If you're suffering from always being broke every March of the year, by the time we're getting into spring, you get broke. It happens like that every year. You know, curses have patterns. When there's a failure in your life, there's usually a pattern to it. 
when you've recognized those things, you're not supposed to anticipate it out of fear. You're supposed to start to pronounce the name of God concerning your finances when you see those things coming. And you say, Lord, spring is coming and this year I will not be broke. Thanksgiving is coming and I will not quarrel with my family. Christmas is coming and I will not fight with my children. You see, every one of those things that you've noticed that is a pattern in your life, you can call the name of God because the Bible says when you do, you will be saved. Baptize your situation in the name of God, folks, and things will start to, be, to, to turn around. Now, the very first thing in the three things that I want to bring out here is this. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Folks, when you call the name of God, call it and use it with authority. Many of us pray in the name of Jesus and we sound as if we are at the mercy of God's whether I'm going to do it or not grace because people have told us that God is only going to do it if he wants to do it so when I'm praying for somebody to be healed I pray and you know say you know what now I'm praying if God wants to heal you he'll heal you if I'm praying for God to bless my finances, I pray, I say the name of Jesus at the end of my prayer, but there is no authority because even I am not confident that that name can deliver the result that I want. So in order for you to make the most of his name and to get the salvation that comes in his name, you have to recognize that all authority is in that name. And if all authority is in that name and I have a child that is manifesting a behavior that is contrary to the word of God and I know by the understanding of God's word that I have that that could be the activities of demons in the life of that child. I'm not just going to say, God, let this child behave well in Jesus' name. I will say in the mighty name of Jesus, if there are any forces or any notions or any curses in the life of this child, I command you to leave in the mighty name of Jesus. That is what you do when you believe that all authority is in that name. Yeah. In my house, I don't beg my children to go upstairs when I just want to be downstairs with my wife. I don't beg them. I don't say, do you think you can maybe perhaps go to your room and watch TV for like two minutes, please? I do not beg my children. Because all authority in that house has been given to me. Because the Bible says that the husband is the head of the house. Not, as a, not a head to dominate. You are, a, you are the head to handle responsibility for the service of your household. I am doing my children a disservice if I beg them to go upstairs. I just tell them, folks, upstairs now. I need some time with your mom. And they will obey simply because... They have seen my authority work in their favor. When all their mates had the flu and were coughing out and sneezing off and it was lasting longer than a few days, they saw my authority work because I stood by their bedside and I said, you will go to school tomorrow in the name of Jesus because I rebuke the infirmity. They have seen me put my authority to work and they know that my authority works when they wake up in the middle of the night from a dream, my daughter at the time was fond of having, was known to have dreams. She would see things chase her in the middle of the night. And one day, she happened to have woken me up. And I don't like being woken up because I don't get much sleep most times because I'm busy doing stuff. So she woke me up and I was like, what is the problem? She said, things are chasing me in the dream. I looked her in the eye. I said, go back to sleep. And when you see them, tell them that I said they should stop. And that was the last time she woke me up. And that has been more than a year. So folks, when you put your authority to work in submission to the dictates and the principles of heaven, you do not have any trouble telling your children to do stuff. You don't have any trouble telling demons to go. The man that was known as the centurion in the Bible, he said to Jesus, no, you don't have to follow me to come and heal my servant. He said, I am a man under authority. I say to this one, go, and it goes. I say to that one, come, and it comes. And to my servant, I issue commands. 
I have taught this before about a year ago that the authority of a believer has those three things that it is capable of. It is capable of telling the things that you don't want to go. Capable of telling the things that you want to come and then commanding things to begin to serve you. This economy will serve me. The time and the seasons that we live in will serve me because I am a man under authority. I know how to save for things to go and save for things to come. So because I'm a man under authority and God's authority is what I am under, I exercise authority in my home just as every believer should exercise authority in the realm of the spirit over principalities and powers, over dominions, over illnesses, over the ill wind of the enemy that blows across nations and across seasons. Each and every one of us need to know that not only do we invite the Holy Spirit to come, not only do we baptize our mentalities and thinkings and paradigms in the name of God, we also also need to speak that name with authority the differentiator is that the real time okay that's it the authority that Jesus had was the differentiator in his ministry the Bible says when he began to spoke and demons were fleeing the elders of the people who were supposed to be the descendants of Abraham who followed, whose fathers followed Moses through the wilderness, who had experienced the mighty working of the hand of God, they said, who is this man who speaks with authority? They didn't say he quotes more scriptures than we, because they knew the entire scripture. They didn't say that he is from a family in the tribe of Israel that is more respected than our families. They kind of earthly attribute. The only claim that became the differentiator of his ministry was that Jesus spoke with authority. And that is the reason why when I am praying, I pray with authority. You have heard the way that we pray here at Communion House. <laughs> we pray with authority. Simply because that is what it takes. To get the name of God working for you. So today I want you to take that with you. Go over the things that are missing in your life. The unanswered prayers. The things that have not yet had the amen of heaven. Go over them and begin to speak with authority. You don't have to yell. But sometimes authority, especially when you have a need, sounds like yelling. And Jesus was recorded several times to have yelled. Because there are times where even demons will not take you seriously when you're whispering. Many of us demons, after you're done saying whatever you're saying, they're like, uh, were you talking to me? Uh, sorry, I wasn't listening. Jesus did not give any demon spirit an opportunity to say that they probably didn't hear him. Because the Bible records again and again that he commanded them to leave. We need to begin to command the situations in our lives to turn around and to change. I am not telling you things that I read in a book written by men. I am telling you things that I've read in God's word that I practice in my own life. I command things to change and they change. Let us do this thing and make the most of the privilege that he has given unto us to speak in his name. Before I go to take my seat, there was something that was put on my heart before the meeting started today. And that is that we should pray together for God to restore our confidence in his name. You see, because this is what happens. Without the right kind of teaching, without the right kind of understanding, some of us have used the name of God without getting the results. And the Bible says you shall not use the name of the Lord in vain. But to some of us, the way that has interpreted in our lives or translated in our lives is that we have called the name of God and it was almost as if we called it in vain because the mountains didn't move, the circumstance didn't change. And over time, we began to lose confidence in the name that is above every other name. So I would love for us, I would love to pray with us and pray over us today. That once again, our confidence in the name of God will be restored so that when we go over those situations and circumstances that seem to have defied the logic of our confidence in God, we can now have a result that is worthy of our confidence. I know there are times wherein 
we are tested and we are tried. Because even God wants to know that you have learned the lesson of the consistency of the faithfulness of God. You see, if you just call his name the first time, every time, you may not truly trust in him. You will just use it like a switch on the wall. You flick it, it comes on, you flick it, it comes on. But when you flick it and it doesn't come on, it makes you ask questions that are deeper than the surface. It is the reason why we go through challenges and sometimes disappointments. So that we can divorce ourselves from the superficial workings of life to get deeper into the reason in the heart of God for every situation which is love and glory. He loves you, but he wants glory to come out of your life. And so if, you are, if your confidence has been shaken over time, I want to pray with you today. And so for a quick moment, if we can just be in an, in an attitude or take a posture of prayer. If we can bow our heads and close our eyes. Wherever you might be in this auditorium, wherever you might be in this room, even for our friends who are watching online or who may be watching the recorded piece later on, I want you to observe this moment, this solemn moment with us. Because we have not, because we ask not. We have not been having victory because we have not been asking for victory. We have not been asking, and that's why we've not been receiving. And so today, I want you to ask by calling on his name, by saying, lover of my soul, creator of all things, the one whose name is love, the one who will never fail me. I am calling you today, and I'm asking. Because you are also the healer of my heart. Your name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that heals me. I am saying, Father, heal my heart of every shaky confidence. That once again, I will remember to pray and I will pray as though I believe. And I will expect as though I am confident in your grace. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Because today, not just through me. But also through the ministry of my sister Manuelita and the ministry of my sister Tonya and the ministry of my wife Rosemary and those who prayed ahead of me today in this meeting you have confirmed that the day that we will receive a new understanding and insight into the power and authority of your name and so, Lord, through the mouth of these many witnesses, it is established that the day is genuinely and truthfully a day of remembrance for us. A day that we get to be reminded once again of the authority that is in that name. So that we are not just guessing what power is in that name, but that we know, Lord, heal our hearts, renew our hope, strengthen our faith. That we may pray with authority. That we may submit to what your name says regardless of what our circumstances say. In the mighty name of Jesus. Still with every head bowed and every eye closed. Just so that we can feel comfortable. For the most part it's not because we're ashamed of the gospel. If you are here today and you were saying brother Moses. I hear you. And thank you for reminding me of the love of God. But I have yet to truly surrender my life to you. I have yet to come to embrace that love that you say he is. I have yet to live my life as though I believe he's the lover of my soul. In fact, I have yet to even acknowledge him as the creator by submitting to him as a living creation. And today, I want Jesus to hear me say he is the Lord of my life. If you fall into that category, no one is looking at you right now. Everyone else is praying. I want you to raise your hand wherever you might be. I want to pray with you. I want to declare over you and declare together with you a new beginning in your life. A new beginning of saying, yes, from this moment onwards, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I surrender all unto him. I give all unto him. Thank you. Thank you for taking that bold step of faith. Father, I thank you for the hands that are up in the room. 
for the rejoicing that is going on in heaven because angels have been anticipating the moment that you make this decision and make this commitment because they've been watching all the blessings that are in heavenly places in your name and they've been eager to rush those blessings to you but then because the commitment was still pending their hands were tied so for those of us who have our hands up in the room I would want you to say this prayer after me Father in heaven I thank you for your love I thank you for Jesus and I thank you for your Holy Spirit as from today on I surrender all to you I acknowledge you as the maker of all things even the maker of my soul the maker of my world and I give the control back to you of this life of mine let me hear your voice and let my heart from now on you are father I am your child from now on I ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon me to fill my heart that I may truly be baptized in the name of the Father in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit I declare that I am born again and I am a new creation in Jesus name amen before